And, um, and so I am based here in Philadelphia, although our headquarters is down in Miami. And our main mission as a foundation is to build informed and engaged communities. We have deep roots in journalism, but we also support the arts and um, community development efforts um, in addition to journalism, because we believe there's many different ways in which communities engage and, um, and are informed by the many things that are going around in our communities. So um, that's Knight Foundation, and I'm just really excited to spend this hour with you all and our four speakers. Tonight's Venture Cafe topic is on meaningful change through creative adaptation. And um, we're going to be talking about how creatives in Philadelphia have and continue to navigate the ever-changing circumstances of our world. And certainly with COVID-19, we've all had our own experience of having to um, adjust to these very uh, unique circumstances that we're facing today. Um, and it has affected how we live, how we work, how we um, connect with other folks. Um, and so hence why we're doing this virtual meeting and not in person. And um, I'll be your moderator tonight. And as we discuss um, and dive deeper into what it means to be inspired by change and how to creative, creatively adapt to such changes. So without further ado, we're gonna kick off our lightning talks. Um, and I'm gonna introduce all the panelists um, at once. And if you could all just unmute yourselves as each one goes, um, I think that would be um, that would be great. So first up, we have Rob Boucher from Tadaima Virtual Pilgrimage. And second, we'll have Pamela Hetherington from Soundspace Performing Arts Speaking. Um, and following her will be Dave Silver from Rec Philly. And um, last but not least, we'll have Selena Yip top it off from uh, Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival. So with that, Rob, would you like Hey, to everyone. Um, did you want me to just kind of introduce myself and the project? Yeah, it'd be great if you could each um, introduce, you, you know, who are you? Who's the organization? Tell us about your project. Um, can you also give us an example or a time of when your organization had to experience a growing pain or a change or a pivot? Um, whether it's personal to you or to the organization that you're representing today. Sure. So, um, yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, Rob Blusher from the Tadaima Virtual Pilgrimage. Um, I work with a lot of groups here in Philadelphia. Um, also do work with Selena at the Philadelphia Asian American Film Fest on their board. And um, yeah, I'm kind of happy to be here and talk about a project that's happening a little further afield. Uh, PAF and the Japanese American Citizens League Philadelphia chapter that I'm also affiliated with are part of a nationwide collaboration of Japanese American community organizations that are hosting a nine week online program called Tadaima Virtual Pilgrimage. Um, during the summer months, the Japanese American community typically visits the former sites of incarceration where our ancestors were uh, held during World War II um, as sort of a, a, a chance to regroup and reclaim our identities as Japanese Americans, as well as um, have an opportunity for, you know, transformative change um, and healing of intergenerational trauma. Unfortunately, with the COVID pandemic, uh, traveling to these locations is not safe to do so, particularly for the many elders who are survivors themselves of the incarceration camps. And unfortunately, the reality is that most of these people who are now in their 80s and 90s may not, in fact, make it uh, to the next season of pilgrimages. So by not having a pilgrimage, this might be losing the last chance that they have to gather with their friends and family and the extended community. And this is not something that our community was able to uh, you know, stomach with the many changes that are happening. So instead, uh, we came together and created this online platform uh, it's a browser-based website called Tadaima, where we basically have nine weeks of thematic programming that is related not just to the incarceration experience, but really all things uh, about the Japanese American community. Uh, we have educational sessions. We have live, uh, what we call Nikkei block parties, where we have musical performances, theater performances, spoken word poets. Uh, we have cooking demonstrations every Sunday. And uh, personally, I was the curator of the online film festival. And over the last seven weeks and coming two weeks, we'll have shown a total of about 65 films uh, completely free 
to people, not just in the United States, but really around the world. And I think that's really the, the thing that is most impressive to me about this whole project. Um, we've been able to essentially uh, expand this audience beyond the Japanese American dense population areas like San Francisco, like LA, like Seattle, to actually look at where these communities have been dispersed. Um, obviously, we have some, but not many, Japanese Americans here in Philadelphia and elsewhere on the East Coast. Um, but it was exciting to learn that there are actually small pockets of Japanese American community members in places like North Dakota or Kansas or the middle of Texas, where they are also tuning in and participating in these virtual events. Um, so it, it's been an incredible way, I think, to not just navigate the current circumstances that we're faced with during the pandemic, but also to kind of re-envision what it could mean to have uh, a future where we're looking at online digital interactions as a means of community organizing and community building, particularly in the case of historically underrepresented communities and individuals that are geographically isolated from these larger population groups. Um, personally, I grew up in a, a community in rural suburban Connecticut about 20,000 people and the only other Japanese Americans were my mom and sister. So, you know, I'm by no means the only person who dealt with those kinds of circumstances growing up. And this is an exciting opportunity to reimagine what community can look like. Um, so I, I certainly encourage everyone to check out the website. Um, it's on the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages website, but if you uh, basically just Google Tadaima, which is T-A-D-A-I-M-A, it means, uh, basically it means uh, welcome home in Japanese. And, um, you know, that's essentially what it is. We're creating an, a home for people around the country and even abroad in this larger diasporic Japanese community to come together, reclaim their identities as Japanese Americans and build the future together. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Rob. And Pamela? Hey, buddy. I'm coming to you from my studio in Brewery Town, uh, which up until last Monday was closed for 18 weeks. So all of our programming moved online. Um, we have a robust kids program and an adult program and also community-based programming that we do here, primarily in the art form of percussive dance. So tap dance is my thing. I've been tap dancing since I was a little kid. Um, and so the studio kind of serves as a conservatory for this American art form. Um, I sort of did all that by the seat of my pants. Uh, we use Zoom, Google Meet, Instagram Live to connect with people and keep our programming going. Um, once the lockdown lifted slightly, we also moved our classes outside. So I'm on the corner here at College and Gerard in Brewery Town. So I just put our, our top boards outside with a speaker and that's what we did. Um, <laughs> uh, dance recital was also different this year. I was able to just set up a tent in Fairmount Park and the kids danced out there. Um, I didn't think it was that unusual because I did a lot of that growing up, but uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer came out and took some photos. So if you um, Google my studio sound space in the Inquirer, you'll see some of the pictures of the kids. Um, going forward, uh, we are able to be inside, but um, planning a lot of things as I can with the weather uh, that are hybrid modeled. Um, still some online, but doing as much outside stuff as I can. Um, in, in the end of August, we'll be roving around Brewery Town with our top boards and a boo box. So <laughs> just trying to stay creative. Um, it's all we can do really. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Fantastic, thanks so much. And we have Dave from Rec Philly. Yeah, thanks Alan. Appreciate Venture Cafe for, for having me and uh, including us in, in the programming. Um, yeah, so my name is Dave uh, Silver. I am the co-founder of Rec Philly. Um, you know, we're a startup here in Philadelphia that we've been growing for the last seven or eight years. We started in the basement at Temple University's campus, really just always caring about providing, you know, opportunity and a platform uh, for local artists. It started as musicians as we were throwing concerts in the basement um, and turned that into the, the, the basement into some dive bars and to some nice venues um, and then started kind of growing our communi community organically by throwing all of these shows. Uh, eventually we realized that just throwing concerts um, 
wasn't the only thing that these artists in Philadelphia needed access to uh, and realized that it really came down to having access to space, as I'm sure a lot of you know, just having access to a safe space to create and meet other people. Uh, so we were in the warehouse, we we're on the fourth floor of a warehouse in North Philadelphia for five years building our business model, um, essentially having other people help pay our rent. Um, you know, 10 people throwing up 30 bucks each. And that was enough for us to have a little studio um, situation um, at Ninth and Dauphin in North Philly. Uh, next thing you know, we had about 200 uh, artists paying our rent. And that was a, uh, a clear sign that there is a much greater need for access to space, access to education, and access just to each other. Um, and that's when we took a big uh, risk as a business and ready to, and took kind of the startup um, mindset to, for high growth. And decided to uh, look for a bigger space to, to build. And um, that's where I'm at now. I'm in my, uh, our creative facility at the corner of 9th and Market. We're actually inside of the Fashion District, um, which is the former gallery, um, which opened this past year. Um, we had, we're 10,000 square feet here uh, with 14 private studios for content creation. I'm actually in one of, uh, one of our recording studios. We have four recording studios, visual labs, dance studios, podcast studios, and we have great partnerships, um, whether it's WXPN or it's Ballard Spar, folks that you know, the business community that helps um, kind of connect, um, you know, between the business and the arts world and provide more support. Um, as you can imagine, building this beautiful space opening in December of just last year, we were open for three months before we had to shut everything down, um, which, which really caused a tremendous hit to our business as I'm sure a lot of y'all can relate to, as many people can relate to. Uh, but we've been now closed longer than we've been open, uh, unfortunately, here in this space. Um, the good news is, is that in two days from now, we're reopening, finally, August 1st, we're gonna reopen our doors. Um, right before we closed, we had about 950 active artist members in our program, uh, which we were so, we were just getting to 1,000. We were feeling so incredibly excited to get to 1,000 strong. Um, and we're going to have to do a lot of rebuilding to get there for August. Um, and that's really what our number one focus is right now is opening our doors, but doing it safely, uh, doing it in a way that artists can feel comfortable um, coming in a shared environment to, to work um, and to create. And that is our number one objective is to make sure our staff um, feels comfortable, that our, our creators feel comfortable, that we put the right policies in place um, to make sure we're doing right by everybody. So we're not, you know, um, causing any issues. So that's really where we're at. Obviously, with us being shut down, as you all had to do, I had to think about how can we provide the value virtually, right? We didn't shut down our membership while we were shut down. We, we, we offered that as an option if they wanted to freeze their membership. But for the folks that still wanted to communicate with us and the community and still have access to our educational programming and curriculum, uh, we offered uh, a virtual membership. And really, that just had to do with um, virtual programming. We ended up going from hosting about 10 to 12 events that we usually did a month to about 23 to 25 events a month. Almost every single day we were trying to provide value to our community via a virtual experience, whether it was a training, a workshop, a, a panel, a concert, whatever it is, we try to provide it. And uh, that, that it was able to, able us to kind of pivot our mindset of what um, a digital experience looks like for our community. And it wasn't just um, you know, you know, us convening in a Google Hangout or anything. It, we tried to provide an experience for the artist or the consumer to come into this virtual experience and just feel a little different. You know, something that's just out of the ordinary. And uh, that was something we focused a lot on, and we and we still are. Obviously, we're not going back to in-person events. So we we spent a lot of time in that in that space of providing a better virtual experience for everyone. Um, and we have a cool, like when you go to our events, you actually, you land in like a virtual living room um, with a custom virtual, a, a custom experience every time. So you can imagine the posters on the wall are different every time you enter the, 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 the living room space um, and things just to that nature. So we've been really focused on that. But now that we are almost in August, we are focused on rebuilding our, our physical membership, but doing it in a safe way, uh, and making sure our artists have access to these resources that we know that they need. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the, our project is reopening our business and, and getting our membership back to where it was while supporting the business community as well and making sure they have access to use our space for their live streaming needs and um, connection to the creative community that we've been doing. Uh, but yeah, that's for, that's for me for now. That's fantastic. And we'll definitely dig into all of these, um, all this amazing work um, a little more as we continue discussion. 
Selena from uh, Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival. You're up next. Hi, I'm Selena. I am the festival director for Philly Asian American Film Festival, or PATH. Um, I use she and they pronouns. Um, yeah, so PATH is uh, one of the many film festivals in Philly. Uh, we have an 11-day film festival in November. Uh, this year, our festival dates are November 5th to the 15th. And we are a multidisciplinary platform for uh, highlighting Asian, um, I'm sorry, Asian and Asian American uh, creators, uh, theater performers, um, filmmakers from all around the Asian American or, or Asian diaspora. Um, I, I guess uh, trying to keep it a little bit short so that we can get into our, our conversation a little bit, but uh, I, I mean, yeah, so definitely the pandemic has affected uh, arts in a way that is pretty um, detrimental in, in um, many different aspects. But um, for us, obviously like theater venues are not really a thing right now and we don't really know when they're going to be. Um, I think a lot of productions have shut down and for the indie film festival circuit, that's, that's a really, really big thing. Um, cause, uh, we don't have big studios backing us. So, um, for the film festival circuit, a lot of us are trying to go online and trying to provide as, uh, interactive and as supportive of a platform for our artists and creators as possible. Um, so right now what it looks like is a lot of, um, a lot of online platforms like Vimeo Livestream, um, things like Elevant and Eventive, these, these online streaming, streaming platforms are providing spaces for filmmakers to virtually screen their events. Um, and now sort of like the next step that we're all trying to figure out is like, how do we create community uh, online where it is safe for us all to be uh, communicating with each other and sharing ideas. I think one of the things that um, festivals do in, in their respective cities is, is provide uh, a physical space for creators to connect with each other, for um, audience to, audiences to be inspired and to like see themselves um, in artwork that is widely distributed. Um, and so now we're sort of just trying to figure out how do we recreate that space online um, and really provide uh, the same amount of uh, impact as we have physically in, in this virtual space. Thanks so much. I have so many questions for each of you. Um, I think some, some questions are cross-cutting um, for, for a few, and, uh, but I think each of you are representing something very unique. And, um, but I'll, I'll start with something that's kind of cross cutting up uh, for, for all four of you. Um, and please feel free to just chime in with, if you feel like in, in responding to the question. Um, but there's just, you, you all mentioned community in, in each of your lightning talks. And so I'm curious to know, um, you know, what does engaging community look like today versus what it looked like perhaps pre-March, pre-COVID-19? Um, you know, for Pamela, you were talking about having to move things outdoors and you also mentioned seasonality. So I'm curious to know, like, does the sense of community change because of the change in environment as well as um, perhaps programming needs to pause because of seasonality? Or um, Rob, you hit on um, something really interesting that I think is, is unique to what you're doing, that there's a very generational aspect to the work. So, um, you know, thinking about the elderly folks who are typically older, um, you know, statistically speaking, also tend to have less access and comfort with technology. So I'm curious to know what community building looks like from there. And Dave, you said you had 900 active artists. So, you know, that's a pretty expansive community that you're looking at. And, and Selena, you mentioned, you know, the, the arts community. So I, I feel like each of you hit on a um, very specific ways of thinking about building community, experiencing community, and, and wanting to continue that given some of the changes that we're experiencing. So. Any of you want to kind of chime in and, you know, talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, Pamela. Um, I have struggled with this question because I feel like in the dance form that I practice in, 
there's so much about it that people come to because they want to be seen, they want to see people, they want to share. Um, also with kids, kids come to dance class to be seen. They don't want to be seen on a computer. Um, so the community and my role as a leader has changed very significantly overnight. Um, I think that people are looking to me to maintain the space, um, literally and figuratively, for what we do here. And there's a lot of that on my shoulders. Um, and continuing the feel and the vibe that we create here, uh, even if we can't all be together. So that's sort of made my programming I think a little quirkier and a little bit more fun. Um, thinking about creative things that get people feeling good, feeling motivated to move, create, inspire, encourage, educate, even if we can't all do it the way we used to. Um, I will admit it takes me a lot of brain power. <laughs> um, but you know, we can only do so much. And um, the, I think the most important thing in this time is to just keep moving. So oftentimes also the community can guide you into what they're looking for. So yeah, that's, that's sort of what I'm thinking about. And um, I will say too that like what I do doesn't really translate to the screen. So there's some of that. I mean, we can put it on a screen, but it doesn't quite translate. And I work a lot with jazz music, um, with jazz tap improviser, and we're doing a lot of live stream concerts. It just is a little strange to like do a, do a performance and like there's no clapping. <laughs> you're like, are we done? Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's if you're the, the kind of person that can uh, um, take on that role, um, it's important or you have to learn on the fly for sure. Community on the virtual. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think about community uh, with in two different lens, lenses from the seat that I'm in. Uh, one is a business owner trying to create community in a physical space, um, which is extremely challenging. And you know, there's only so much you can do when you're just convening virtually, right? It's always nice to see people on the screen, but there's not obviously we all know there's nothing like just being together and sharing those experiences. The other lens is of the artist's lens of community, and I think this is actually. Um, an opportunity, almost a positive opportunity to think as an artist and the community that you're cultivating. Uh, because, you know, as a local artist, when you're just getting started, you really think about the people who are in your surrounding area, people in your zip code, like that is your community. And that you, that's pretty much all you know, when it comes to building community, it's, it's who you see out, it's who's at these events, it's who you can invite to come to your, your gallery, who you can invite to your show. But now we are forced to think about building our community online. And when you think about that, there is no reason why you have to stay in your zip code when you do that. Everyone has access to the link. Everyone has access to, to join you in this chat room. You do not have to rely on the only people who, are, who can support me are the people who can come out to my show. Um, and when we start thinking about that consistently, uh, you know, every day, I'm, now I'm, how can I get people into my, into my Zoom concert? You can really open up your community doors to the world and that's not a second nature thought. That's not like an afterthought. That that can now be their thought right away as their primary focus on building community. So, you know, as an artist, I think it's it's a positive experience to be forced to think about that and to to make your your national international audience almost your first um, invite to try to reach everyone to to join you um, versus just only thinking about who's in your neighborhood. Um, so that's just a, a kind of a positive spin on community. But like I said, there is nothing that will ever be just being with people. We all know that and just sharing those experiences and it's extremely hard uh, to replace that. Selena, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, I think for for festivals, like for, for film festivals in particular, um, at least what I've seen in the Asian American indie circuit is that um, sort of this online platform experience that we're all having has, I mean, we, so, so a lot of different cities have uh, Asian American film festivals or Asian film festivals, um, or, you know, just indie film festivals that have a lot of Asian films in it. Um, and we all have had, you know, conversational relationships. We're all friends to a certain extent, and we've attended each other's festivals, you know, like San Francisco, San Francisco will come to Philly or we'll go to LA and, 
Um, so we all sort of have, have this shared friendship. Um, but this is the first time that we've really considered um, like national programming that we can do together. Um, and so uh, there are artists and filmmakers that are, uh, that have been featured at, you know, multiple film festivals that, that we all share these relationships with. Um, and now it's like the first time that we're all able to um, have this opportunity to create a virtual space for us to, to highlight like one filmmaker and for them to be supported all at once by all of these festivals across the US. Um, so that's, that's really cool. And I think that that is definitely one of the, the biggest positives that I've, I've seen is the ability for us to work with people that we might not have been able to work with before because they're all the way, uh, you know, in the Midwest or in the West Coast um, or even Canada. So um, I think that's really cool in terms of like how our community has changed going online. Um, I would say the one one thing is uh, that I that I uh, am worried about is is always like accessibility and what accessibility looks like when we when we go online. Like how uh, how many of our elders. Uh, know how to use a computer because I know my grandmother does not um you know my grandmother doesn't even own a smartphone so um definitely think about you know who we're who we are unintentionally leaving behind when when we are transitioning to this online world um you know not because we want to but because we have to um my first year at PATH uh you know, I have, an, I have an intern this summer, which is really exciting. And he, uh, he has a capstone project that he interviewed me for today. And he'd asked me, you know, what, was, what is one of the most significant memories you have of PATH? And I remember my first year, um, I came in as like a community engagement coordinator. And one of the things that I had coordinated, and this is also like my first year back in Philadelphia. So I grew up around here with like, you know, strong community ties to Chinatown. My parents like have been here for years, um, but this was my first time uh, as an adult back in Philadelphia. And so, you know, I was just sort of starting to figure out like, what is the lay of the land? What are the local politics? You know, what, who, what organizations are serving which communities? And so um, coming in as like the community engagement coordinator, I ended up having to do a lot of my own research um, and I connected with this organization called CMAC, um, which operates in South Philly, and they have a, a program where they engage elders in a lot of like community building and, and um, you know, having them connect with each other and connecting to the city. And um, so that year we had a, a Bhutanese film that uh, yeah, connected with CMAC and they have a Bhutanese elder program. and one of their pro program managers took the time out of their day on a Saturday afternoon to bring all of these elders, I think there was like 15 of them, on public transportation from South Philly to Chinatown to go watch this film. Um, and for many of them, this is the first time that they were able to watch film, film content in their language that they could understand on a, you know, a big screen. Um, and you know, engage in a Q and A in their language, like very comfortably in like a physical space, um, and that was like a really, really special moment. I think to know that I had, um, you know, a, a hand in in creating this experience for them, um, and I just worry about the 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 possibility of, of like you know how how can we how can we have that again? Like how can we have that again in this online space? Um, how can we create that community um, when when a lot of our elders are disconnected not only by the fact that they don't have the technology but but you know they also are disconnected by language like you know my grandmother even though she speaks Cantonese fluently like her reading and writing is not necessarily like great and so there's a lot of technical language that you know I still have to like try to get my parents to read her mail, even though it's all in Chinese, right? So th there's just so many barriers to, um, 
you know, different parts of our community that I, I am worried about, you know, how do we um, intentionally include uh, and, uh, and intentionally, like, allow them to, to access, like, what we bring to the table. And, um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think issues of accessibility definitely kind of spans um, various different income levels, different ages, and um, even people with different types of abilities. Uh, I think that's an area of work in which, um, you know, technology, we haven't really thought about full ad adoption of how to think about that. Rob, did you want to chime in? Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting hearing everyone talk about this idea of trying to reclaim the physical community because in all actuality, uh, I feel more connected today to the Japanese American community than I did in February before the lockdown. Because uh, simply put, there's just not a lot of us here in Philadelphia. I mean, on the 2010 census, there were less than 2,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans combined in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, about 120,000 Asian Americans in total. There's 120,000 Japanese Americans in the city of Los Angeles alone. So like it is minuscule compared to anywhere on the West Coast, right? And um, just having a sense of, of what that means to kind of uh, be in a, a relatively isolated place like this, definitely we have community and we do get together and we have events throughout the year and we know each other all pretty well. Um, because there just aren't that many of us. But the reality is, you know, now that we're in this digital space, I'm talking to people on a weekly, if not daily basis that I've known for years, but would probably see only once or twice a year at like major national convenings. And now they're part of my daily life. And in some cases, they're part of my workflow. And some of these people are now offering me jobs because I also freelance. And it's, it's kind of crazy because, you know, imagining this kind of economy uh, six months ago even was completely unthinkable. And, um, you know, I think that there's a lot to be said for that, but uh, just, I guess, to the point, we, we had talked a little bit about um, elders and the, the technology gap, and that definitely is real and that exists for sure. And I think especially in like newer immigrant communities where language access is also an issue that kind of further complicates it. Um, in addition to uh, income levels and uh, access to um, high-speed internet, those are all issues that are, are kind of expanding upon each other um, that making it difficult for some of the elder immigrant community to join in these kinds of programs. But at least in the Japanese American community, um, you know, my great grandparents came here in the 1920s, right? Like I'm a fourth generation American. We have elders who are in their 80s and 90s who are born here on American soil. And so, um, you know, for them to connect to these programs, definitely it takes some coaching. But I would also say to everyone who is doing these kinds of online programs, don't count out the elder community simply because of their age. In all honesty, they have been the most eager and excited and active participants in everything that we're doing on Tadaima. And it's incredible because you know, this is such a community-based organization that we have people emailing us out of the blue saying, hey, can I host this program? And so, for example, next Friday, we're going to host a live sing-along karaoke that 80-year-old uh, ukulele player from California reached out to us and said, I, I would love to get together with my group of Japanese-American ukulele players and do this thing, and we'd love for it to be part of Tadaima. And that's the kind of flexibility that we have in this platform, in this space. And, um, you know, I'm thrilled that we can continue to do these types of programs. Um, and we'll continue to brainstorm, you know, as, as we hit these bumps in the road and, and figure out how to get even more people involved. I guess the last thing that I wanted to mention, um, even outside of the United States, I mean, we have uh, streaming data suggesting that people from 46 different countries have been participating in Tadaima. And uh, the Japanese diaspora is, is, you know, everywhere in the world, right? And um, that doesn't necessarily mean also that everyone participating is Japanese American or Japanese. You don't have to be, obviously, to enjoy the programming. But it is also very incredible to be able to bring together members from the Brazilian Japanese community and members of the, uh, you know, Southeast Asian Japanese community and folks who are living in Europe and that they're knowing that they're participating in these things and in some cases engaging directly in, in the live uh, programs. Um, so that's kind of the world that we live in and I think it's as big as you dream it. It's just, uh, you know, we're all 
uh, creative people, obviously, on this panel. And it's just about how big do we dream it and, and what are the, the next uh, solutions that we can come up with for these creative problems. That's awesome. Rob, I always appreciate your optimism and always seeing the bright side of things. I think it's why you've been able to do what you've been able to do. Um, I, before I ask the next question, does anyone on the panel want to pose another question to the other person or a reaction to what someone else shared? No, nothing inspiring? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, you know, Rob, I, I really love how you framed um, this reclaiming of physical community and really seeing kind of the brighter spots to, to this digital community. Um, and I want to kind of stay on that topic a little bit for you all in terms of there are definite pros and definite cons to engaging with people online um, and having this virtual experience and, and relationship with folks. I think crossing geographic boundaries and borders and just discovering new people is something that Selena that you really you um, that you really press on and also Dave in terms of sometimes we are really limited to our, our zip codes um, and in Philadelphia we're a very neighborhood based city and so sometimes it takes a lot to kind of, you know, really think about where else can I go and who else would appreciate my um, my artwork. And I think one of the things that I, I was kind of thinking about as you were all sharing is, um, for me, um, uh, the, the practice of art and of being creative requires quite a bit of vulnerability and it requires a safe space. Um, and I think uh, an openness for people to, to welcome a new experience or the expression of whomever the artist is and whatever they're expressing and how they're doing it. Um, and I'm wondering, how have you all navigated that? How do you create that safe space, that sanctuary or um, that, that open platform for people to be able to experience the, the artistry or the creative um, expression in full? Um, and I guess that it's also kind of stemming from a question of like, what actually does translate well on screen? or on the flip side, like what hasn't translated well? So I threw out a few questions and you can kind of pick whichever one you want to react to, but they're kind of encompassed in, you know, this experience of, of, of artistry and creative creativeness. Yeah, Pamela. Uh, the first thing I thought of was, <laughs> um, I think what translates is, um, I don't know if I'm gonna say this right, but people who are doing their art form because they absolutely have to. And um, it's not a com necessarily a commercially <laughs> viable art form, what I do, but um, I absolutely have to do it, so I do it. Um, and I was also thinking about the kids, and I teach a lot of kids and I love teaching. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, it's only one part of what I do, but I love to teach. And I found myself not being so attached to achievement. Um, I, what I found to be achievement and what I defined as success were really different as we moved online. And um, I was really interested in the ways in which they were responding to different kinds of material, like historical information that we never have a chance to do in class or um, things that were going on at home and how that was informing their feeling that day and how that much they wanted to do um, with what we were working in. So we have to respond to the times and um, I think we all respond to them with how we approach our art and um, it definitely makes you take a step back and clear away a lot of the, the stuff you feel you have to do, which I sort of appreciated. Um, I really enjoyed the opportunity to not feel like I was on the hamster wheel all the time because I run a business also. And you feel like you have to like have an ROI and like all these people coming through the door. And like essentially what I am is just a very simple person that loves to dance. I love to create and um, that's what I sort of tried to make come through the screen. And um, all that's very elemental and human to all of us. Um, that feeling of needing to create and, and express. So that's sort of roundabout way, but um, I personally appreciate the way it made me kind of strip away like everything else that was um, making me be 
the entrepreneur. I was like, now I can sort of focus on stuff and like really feel things I haven't felt in a while. And I think we've all been feeling the feels, but <laughs> um, that's what came through for me. Yeah, lots of different feels. Um, before we, we move on, um, I just, I liked how you talked about stripping things away, keeping it simple. Um, and, and I think that that's, a, that's something to definitely keep in mind as we're thinking about what future experiences look like is how do we make sure that we're just our authentic selves and it comes across through the screen. Anyone else want to weigh in? I think a, a big part of um, how do, do you create like a safe space for a community in an online place, um, obviously aside from the, I guess, the obvious answer of making sure that you don't get Zoom bombed, um, is to really lay some ground rules for your community and just kind of contextualize what it is that you're hoping to achieve. The way that we did that with Tadaima, we had a, a pretty heavily produced uh, opening ceremony um, that basically gave a, a brief history of sort of Japanese immigration to the United States, the World War II incarceration experience, um, the physical spaces and their importance to the Japanese American community members who were incarcerated there. And, um, you know, kind of talked a lot about, you know, what it was that we were hoping to achieve in doing this summer virtual pilgrimage. So I think um, for anyone who participated in that, and I, I could share the link in the chat afterwards, um, you know, there's, there's no way to misconstrue what it is that we're trying to do. And I, I don't know that you can necessarily have that level of intentionality in all kinds of virtual programming, but at least for a sustained, you know, nine week program like the one that we are executing, um, having that groundwork to help people understand what it is that we're doing, why we're doing it, who the people are that are involved and how they can participate. Um, that was essentially giving people permission to not just participate in, in the virtual pilgrimage, but I think also to uh, start uncovering some of the, the historic trauma that they themselves might have faced if they are incarceration survivors or maybe the intergenerational trauma if their relatives were incarcerated. Um, because even to this day, I think there's a, a real sense of shame um, you know, for people who were incarcerated during World War II and there's a reluctance to talk about it. And a lot of our elders uh, who were the immigrant generation never spoke about it and never opened up about it, kind of carried that trauma with them to their grave. Um, but thankfully, you know, the second generation, third generation, these folks have told us those stories. And I think it, it's it, in our community's experience, it was really up to the grandkids um, who didn't have that filter to basically say, you know, hey, grandpa, grandma, like, what was it like? Like, you guys were in prison, like, that sucks. Like, tell me more. Whereas their own children might have had that understanding that, oh, this is really bad. Like, I'm not ever going to ask this question because, you know, I, there's this sense of like trauma that exists around the subject. So I think it's very layered and it's very specific in terms of how the Japanese American community is responding to it in this moment. But I think also the, the reality of, of the political reality that we live in right now and the many parallels that we see with immigrant detention and uh, just the incredible uh, lack of um, equity uh, in terms of our society. I mean, it's it just everything is sort of happening at once. And the pandemic has also revealed, you know, all these fractures within the society that I think we have known for a long time as uh, historically marginalized peoples. But it's also in, in the open right now in a way that it hasn't necessarily been. Um, so I think it's a good thing ultimately, but I also think that um, it's just an additional challenge. And I think probably an opportunity that most of us can look at um, as we do this kind of work. Awesome. Selena? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think what I'm hearing from like everyone, it sounds like like how do we create a safe space is, is to really remember like who are we creating these spaces for? Right. Like, I know for, for me, like, one of the things that I really considered, um, like, I mean, to, like, disclaimer, like, this is my first year as the festival director, and so, like, what a, what a year to start, and um, uh, for me, it was, so we're, we're transitioning anyway, so this was always going to be hard, um, and 
even at the beginning prior to uh, the pandemic and prior to lockdown, like I had to constantly remind myself, like, who am I doing this for? Like, who am I doing this work for? Like, um, who's included in this community? Uh, and for me, it's like the filmmakers, obviously, um, because we are a film festival, but, you know, we also have community partners. We have theater performers. Um, and then we also have our staff. Like, you know, this, the, the people who, who are working on this festival are also super important. And how do we create a space where they feel like their work is being respected? Because um, I think that like a lot of the times, like, you know, when, when what Pamela was saying earlier and how like a lot of that pressure of being like a business person, being an entrepreneur has been like stripped away. is like, you have to remember that, like, what, what, what are our goals here? Like, why, why did we start this in the first place? Um, and I, and, and for me, like, I always want my staff to feel like their work is important, um, and that it's impactful and that they're appreciated for what, for, for what their voices bring to the table. Um, yeah. Dave? Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't really sure how to answer this. Um, Rob kind of inspired, um, something that we, we were doing when he mentioned the, uh, the kind of setting ground rules as a way to provide a safe space for folks. Um, you know, for us, the safe space is the, is the place that we built. That's why we built it was to have a safe space for us creatives, but the, but digitally it's, it's a whole different ball game. And there was one event where what's, what's really sticking in my mind that we had to create the safe space for, which was um, early June, right around all of the protests, uh, the death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement we hosted an event which was called Brave Space, which was an opportunity for people who had just like all of these feelings, you know, their home, quarantined, have so, many, so much emotions running through them. Uh, we wanted to provide a, a place for our community to, to share how they're feeling or even just like solutions that they want to get to. Um, but, you know, what outlet did they have at that point? So we created this event called Brave Space and to, and to kick it off, uh, my business partner, Will Toms, you know, he hosted the event and he did a great job of setting ground rules, which really inspired an amazing conversation that lasted, you know, three, four hours of people sharing their feelings. And it's, it was from setting the ground rules from the beginning. Um, it was, you know, instead of people, um, you know, asking or giving suggestions on what people should, should do, it was always forming it in, in some sort of question instead of a suggestion. So people didn't feel like they were getting attacked in any kind of way. Or when you're saying something that people related to, instead of jumping in and just saying something, they would give them like a little, a little hand signal to, to showcase that you relate to that feeling. Um, and then reminding people of those rules for people who came in late. So just to keep that quick, I, I, that was the biggest, uh, the most relevant experience of really creating a safe space online was when you, when you set the intentions on how it's gonna go and then you remind folks of that um, and you stick to those rules throughout. Um, I thought that was powerful. Yeah, no, these are uh, a mix of conceptual, strategic, as well as tactical advice for us all to kind of think about as we're thinking about, you know, how do we continue navigating um, this digital world. Um, I have a few more questions left for the panel, but I, I know that we have a few folks who um, may want to pose a question from the audience. If you want to unmute or put a question in the chat box, I'm, I'm happy to ask the question on your behalf. Um, but wanted to make sure folks knew that you can um, you can unmute your mic and pose the question yourself. So I'll just give folks a minute if you want to chime in with a question. All right. I'm I so uh, I just have a few more and we you know we're we are we're our session's gonna end around um, at, at 545. So um, I'm curious to know if you each have advice for um, for folks who are about to embark on a change, whether it's a, a career change or a personal change or an approach to perhaps some of the things that we hit on around like how you're engaging the community. Um, I would love to hear, you know, each of your advice on how do you navigate that? How do you how do you begin processing that experience and um, you know, are there things that we can learn from you all and take away with us tonight? Where's that wealth of knowledge, <laughs> Dave? Yeah, I don't, I don't really, you know, 
I think everyone's experiencing change. I, there's, it's really hard to imagine that you're listening to this right now and there's not change happening in your life in some probably major way. Everyone is, has to adapt in, what, in what's happening. Um, and clearly nobody knows what to do. <laughs> and I think that's always a good thing to keep in the back of your mind is that there's probably no right way on going about the way you're gonna change up and just getting ready to, to roll with it. And so that's a piece of advice that I always give or I always take as well is, is um, no one knows what they're doing and just kind of go with the flow and um, don't add any of that added pressure that's, that's not necessary. Um, I'll think of more advice maybe as other people are talking, but that was the first thing that came to my mind that I wanted to share. That is both comforting and unsettling at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. Yeah, Selena? I am the opposite of that. I am a pre prepper. I am a Excel sheet multi-tabbed prepper. Um, so that's how I deal with change. Um, no, but I, I mean, I, I think it's, and, and you know, with my answer and with Dave's answer, like, it's obvious that you have to really just do what feels best for you, right? And I think, like I said, this is my first year as the festival director. Um, this is only my, my second, second, third something year with PATH. And, um, and so like, it, yeah, like Dave said, we're, we're all going through changes, you know, pandemic aside, um, always. And this year is a really big year of transition for all, all of us at PATH. Um, so what I've, I've found really helpful, and I'm saying this because I also need to take my own advice, is um, self check-ins are, are really important um, to know, you know what, your, what your capacity and what your boundaries are. Um, like how much work are you putting into a project and is it, is it worth that much stress or anxiety that you, you might feel from it? Um, you know, just, just dealing, dealing with certain people or dealing with whatever, um, like distributors or filmmakers, whoever is like giving you that, uh, anxiety inducing conversation or, or whatever, like being able to check in with, being able to check in with yourself, um, and really, you figure out like what is the best way for me to go about this that allows for relief um but also obviously like to do your job um so something that like i've had to do is really like like i i have a lot of anxiety so <laughs> obviously because i've, I've got that multi-tab sheet um but yeah it definitely just like being able to take a step back to breathe and to to check in and and really figure out where I'm at emotionally with my work. Um, it helped me a lot with, with all of the changes that are happening with this transition, with the pandemic, with my personal life, like all of it. Um, yeah. Awesome. I think, um, you know, after 15 years or so of uh, hosting events professionally, um, my attitude is that, you know, when you're hosting an event, something invariably is going to go wrong. And you just got to hope that it's something that you can control. And if not, try not to worry about it because you can't control it. And it's going to happen one way or the other. And I think that's kind of the situation that we find ourselves in as a country, as a city, as a world right now. I mean, there's just so much that's happening, so much that's changing on a daily basis. I think it's easiest to just kind of focus on, you know, what is immediately within your ability to control and try to stay in that comfort zone if you can um, while also being willing to take risks because this is everyone's reality right now and I think people in general are regardless of what political debates are happening are going to be a little bit more considerate about the reality that we're all brand new at this way of functioning um, I guess the last thing that I'll add is that my wife and I are expecting our first child in like two months so, you know, that is the biggest unknown, and this is a crazy time to be doing that. But um, compared to everything that we will be looking forward to with that, uh, the work stuff just doesn't seem so bad anymore. Rob, I'm right there with you. Um, I'm due in September, so I feel, I feel all the whatever anxieties and excitement that you might be having. <laughs> Lots of babies happening this fall, by the way, guys. We're going to have an influx of population in Philly. Um, 
So before uh, we only have about two more minutes with you all, this has been awesome. And I want to make sure Gary, you and I are in the same wavelength. I have the same question. How can the Venture Cafe community and Philadelphia community help you all? And I'd love for each of you just to um, take a moment to respond to that question because we want to make sure that, that we're supporting you and um, also just thank you for the time that you spent and sharing kind of your experiences and everything. So why don't we start with Pamela? Sure, and I want to say congrats to all the parents. I have three of my own. They're, they've been home with me since March. They're 14, 11, and five. <laughs> so I am simultaneously doing the homeschooling, all that. Um, my struggle always is just I'm a, I'm a one woman show. And this is great for me because I get to meet new people even if I don't get to see you in person. Um, and I love uh, knowing more about what's going on here. I think uh, because I do everything myself at the studio and my own art, I'm really bad about getting out of the house even um, to do things outside of what I do every day. So it's nice to be connected to new things and uh, meet new people who are like-minded and it inspires me. So I'd like to be kept up in the loop. Awesome. Um, Rob? Um, you know, I would just say, uh, come check out the website because everything that we're offering on Tadaima is completely free to participate in. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you don't have to be Japanese American to enjoy these programs. There's just so much there. I mean, if you're interested in Japanese food or Japanese American food, we've got the cooking tutorials every Sunday, um, plenty of great free films to watch. We do educational sessions. Um, there's the concerts on Saturdays. We do live artist talks on Fridays. Um, so it's just an incredible amount of content. And uh, it just, I think if you check out the website, you'll find something that you might be interested in. Um, so yeah, come check it out. Uh, come participate and, and help spread the word because um, it's a lot of work and, and we want as many people to benefit from this programming as possible. Awesome. And Dave? Um, yeah, I mean, the support the Venture Cafe and the, the whole community has provided our organization up to this point is all, you know, all we can ask for. So we appreciate all the support of always being open to, for collaboration. Um, understanding that, you know, there's a lot of business folks and um, startup folks and corporations that are in the Venture Cafe network and understanding that, you know, our network consists of the creative entrepreneurs, the, the artists in the community and, and knowing that we try to be a bridge between the two, just always keeping in mind that, um, when you want to connect with the creative community where, you know, that's what we're here for. Um, and always try to think of, you know, adding that live music or adding that videographer, or adding that to component to your event. And some people think it's sometimes like a big headache to have to think about and do and all the plugs and all the technology that you might not know about, but that's what we're here for. So, um, I would just say keeping that in mind when, when thinking about programs coming up, um, is that type of collaboration. Awesome. And Selena? uh check us out on social media we have facebook we have instagram we're kind of on twitter um our festival is in november it's november 5th to the 15th um we're probably going to be making quite a few announcements about what that program looks like and where it's going to be and who's going to be there so following um our instagram and our facebook and signing up for our newsletter are going to be the best ways to keep updated um on what our festival is going to look like this year but um yeah i think that's that's the best way to support uh but i, I think also yeah uh also support philly artists our partners um obviously yeah, there's, there's tons of ways to support. Also, just by being here um, and listening to us talk. Like, that's, that's great. I mean, I feel, I feel great. I feel supported. So I don't know about y'all, but I feel very happy that there are people here just listening to us. Um, you know, so. Also, I'll just add for all of you, you can always donate <laughs> um, and make some sort of contribution. I'll just shamelessly put that plug in for you guys since no one um, explicitly mentioned that. Uh, well, it is, uh, we are over time. And so thank you so much for everyone who joined us for this session. Um, it, it, it was such a pleasure for me just to be able to spend this time with you and have this conversation. Thank you for being vulnerable and for sharing your experiences and how you've all been navigating um, our circumstances today. 
Um, and also seeing the brighter side of things. I think having an encouraging conversation, we just can't have any more of those, um, in addition to having some of some real talk as well. Um, and just thankful that we're all part of the Philly community to get together. So with that, um, I will say good night to you all and wish you all the best. Take Thanks care. Thanks, Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Yeah. See ya.